name is Adrian Reed, and my topic today is whose perspective is it anyway? Practical techniques for understanding tricky stakeholders. And I know from the, the, the few conversations, from the, the few, of you, few of you I've met already tonight, that um, we're, you know, as a group of practitioners in this room, we're, we're all from different industries and different companies. But I would suspect one thing that unites us as a community of profession, professionals is that we all get to work with stakeholders. But not only that, it's probably the case that we occasionally, occasionally, have to deal with a tricky stakeholder or 20. <laughs> so raise your hand if you've ever in your career, I <laughs> hope Tina's got a hand right at the back, <laughs> if you've ever in your career had to deal with a tricky stakeholder. Okay, I think, I think that's everyone right now. Now keep your hand raised if you're dealing with one on your project right now. Okay, that's almost everyone. Those of you that put your hands down, it's probably because the tricky <laughs> stakeholder is in the room and you don't want them to know, so, but, so I, won't, I won't prod that point uh, anymore. So, so I want to talk about stakeholder analysis, stakeholder engagement, uh, and I want to share a few tips, tricks, techniques that we might use to uh, really understand our stakeholders. I'll be sharing a whole range of techniques. I'll be going through them relatively quickly. There is a, a references slide at the very back when you download the slides if you want to know more about any of them. Um, by the way, um, if, I, I know sometimes people like to take photos and tweet and stuff, that's totally fine, so do feel free to tweet, take pictures. If you tag me in anything you tweet, that would be very much uh, uh, appreciated. But I think there's one thing that's interesting in the BA community, is we talk a lot about stakeholders. We don't talk so much about stakes. And when you think about it, a stakeholder is only really a stakeholder because they have a stake. And if we're finding stakeholders are tricky, maybe if we get a better understanding ourselves of their stake, we might be able to collaboratively navigate our way through the project even, even better. So I'll talk through some techniques, but I, I, I want to start with a bit of a story. And I'm going to kill the slides for this bit, actually. And, and I warn you in advance, this story, it, it, it's, it's a bit of a curveball, so strap yourself in, because it is relevant, I promise. <laughs> it, it won't seem so at the beginning, but it, it will. Is it about Portsmouth City Council? It, it, it isn't about Portsmouth City Council, <laughs> stuff, but, but, but that's a good, you're in the right area. <laughs> um, so I am what I like to describe as a reluctant driver. Um, I do have a driving licence, I've never enjoyed driving. I didn't pass on my first or second attempt it was a big number, and we'll leave it at that. <laughs> and I also don't know anything about how cars work. Okay? In terms of what I know how to do, I know how to refill the, um, the, the, the spray, the screen wash, screen wash the, na the name escapes me, the screen wash at the front. I just don't know, about, know how to, about, to do the dipstick on the oil. Um, and that's about the extent of my knowledge. So when I take my car, and you can, this, you can tell this is definitely my car by the personalised plate there. Um, <laughs> that, that, obviously, that's photoshopped or actually Microsoft painted, I think, uh, on there. Where, when I take my car in for a service, I sort of have to trust that the, the, that the mechanics are going to be honest with me. And so I do what I guess most of us do. I, I, I go to a, a garage I've been going to for some time. It happens to be the local branch of a national chain. It's a national chain that you would, you would be familiar with. And when I last took it in, I booked online. And the online process was slick as anything. You put your car reg number in, it knew the engine size, it knew the service category, you put on an MOT, you got a discount, you added a, an aircon service. Great. Pr paid, ready, booked. I rock up on the day of the service. And you know in that like, little weird office bit they have attached to garages that always feels really sort of uh, 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 weird. It was like there was chaos in there. I got there, and there was a queue. And I could see the poor person behind the, the counter, and there was another mechanic with him as well, were navigating themselves through about three or four different screens. And the sense I got was they just had a new IT system installed. Now, I could see that they were having to revert back to using a paper diary. <laughs> Right, so all of the stuff was on this system, but they were having to write it all out because they were navigating between different screens and 
so on and so forth. And when I got there, they said they weren't actually expecting me. Okay, so I booked it online, but that hadn't got through to them. But they were like, well, it's all right, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll squeeze you in. It's our, mis our mistake. And in the back of my mind, I'm having that, you're going to squeeze me in? <laughs> like, like, how good, <coughs> how, how high quality is this work going to be? But anyway, I, you know, I go away, I go on with my day, and I get a call around lunchtime, and they tell me that there's a, a fault with the water pump, um, which I'd, I'd suspected for some time because there had been some leaking uh, air, antifreeze coming out of it. They tell me how much it's going to be cost, it, it, it's going to cost, and it's fine, so I give them authorisation. The end of the day comes, and I get a call, and it's the kind of call you never want from your garage. The words I remember were, there have been some complications. <laughs> but they said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You know, we'll have it ready for you tomorrow. The next day, the regional manager of this arrangement rings. And he, his tone is even more sombre. And he says, we made a mistake. Now, keep in mind, I know nothing about cars. And I don't know if other, other folks in this room find this, but I find that, and perhaps it's because of the perception of my gender, um, I find that mechanics and sometimes think I should know about cars. So keep in mind that what I'm, what I'm about to say, I had no idea what it meant. A out of interest, raise your hand. Does anyone in the room know anything about cars, even broadly? Okay, a couple of people, okay, so you might find, I found that when people who know about cars hear what I'm about to say, they, they do a sharp intake of breath, that kind of moment. Anyway, he, he said to me, there's been a problem. We were, when we went in to change the water pump, we had to, I think, retension the timing belt. We made a mistake with the timing belt. Tension, it slipped, there was a loud bang, and uh, yes, I'm seeing, I'm seeing laughs. There was a loud bang, and we now need to assess the damage that we've done. Don't worry, sir, we'll charge, you know, we'll pay for all the damages. We're going to have to get specialists to work on it, but it's our fault. We'll fess up to it. So I'm like, fine. Because think about my stake in this. My, what I really value is a safe car and a car that's reliable. I don't actually use my car that often. It doesn't really bother me that it's going to be in there for a while because it's probably safer there than parked in on my street, to be honest. So anyway, a week goes by. They're keeping me updated. It's not ready. They had to put a scope down, and, and it turns out they'd broken um, eight of the 16 valves. They had to get valves shipped in because there weren't enough in the UK or the motor factors didn't have. Um, you know, I didn't know. This, this is major surgery on the engine, but I had no idea. Um, they had to send bits of it off to have it pressure tested, and they were talking about opening the head. I had no idea, but I ga gather it's a head gasket or something. And anyway, after four weeks, it's ready. And I go and collect it. And again, there's chaos in the little office attached to the, uh, attached to the garage. And I, I could hear, and it was the regional manager in the, like, the little office within the office, yelling at someone on the phone as I go in there. And all I can remember him saying is, you tell them to get the parts here tomorrow or I'll ring and I'll cancel the entire Euro car parts contract for the whole of the south of the UK. So I'm like, this, this situation, this picture is so dysfunctional on so many levels. You've got new IT that's not working. You've got a regional manager who's shouting at other people. <coughs> You've got the, you know, mistakes being made in the garage. Maybe some of these things are related. Anyway, I pick up the car. I pay what's due and I drive out and it's really smooth drive, I won't lie. I look down at my speedo and I do a U-turn and take it straight back to the garage because this is what my speedo looked like. <laughs> and um, but those of you that are observant will notice that this little thing here means the handbrake's on and that means it's doing 140 miles an hour. Now, it's a 2007 Fiesta. I don't think it could ever do 140 <laughs> miles an hour. So I take it back, and the mechanics actually are really friendly. I mean, I've been going there for years, and they're really apologetic. And the, what one of them says, well, he attaches the diagnostics and says, well, the diagnostics say it's fine. <laughs> We've seen this before. There's a back door that we can use to reset it. I don't know how to do it. My colleague does. Uh, tomorrow, so if you leave it with us, we'll hack in through the back door and reset it. 
And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and they do, to their credit, they do. And it, 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 you know, the Speedo was working again. But I never trusted the car after that because so many things had happened. So anyway, a couple of weeks later, I was in the pub with my friend Gary. And Gary does know about cars. I, I don't know if it's talking about the name, but I find most people called Gary seem to know about cars. But he's, he's got an extreme knowledge. He's like a petrol head. And I was telling him this story, and I, you know, I got to the point where I said timing belt, and he, went, he did that thing. And, and I explained it to him, and he said, Adrian, Adrian, how old is your car? I said, it's a 2007 Fiesta. He said, how much do you think it's worth? I'm like, well, to be honest, it's got dents on it because I drive it in a city and sometimes, sometimes people will leave a new dent in it for you. I don't know, maybe £800, £1,000 if I'm lucky. He says, Adrian, if they've sent that out, they've probably spent somewhere between one and £2,000 getting it, you know, the, it's basically, you know, major engine surgery. And I was like, really? Because if I'd have known that, it, like if I'd have known that, if, they, if, I'd have, if, if we'd have known each other's stake in this, then we probably could have come up with a different solution. Because I'd have just said, give me 500 quid and we'll call it quits. <laughs> you know, scrap the thing. It, I, I genuinely only thought it was going to last another year. Okay, fast forward six weeks. Six weeks after they practically, from my sort of numpty understanding of engines, had pretty much rebuilt a big chunk of the engine. And um, there's a catastrophic failure on another part of the car. And it's to do with the braking system. And I'm not happy to drive it and I'm not happy to sell it because it, I, I couldn't live with myself if someone injured themselves. So I scrapped it. And I got the princely sum of £135 for it. <laughs> now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, that's a cute story, Adrian, but we don't work on Ford Fiestas and we don't work in garages. But like, zoom out, uh, zoom out a bit. I bet you've seen situations where someone has imposed IT on someone without understanding how that IT needs to work. And I bet you've seen situations where there's a dysfunctional manager, someone yelling commands at people. And you've seen people like the mechanics who really were trying to do their best, but the, 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 the situation around them hamstrung them. And you sort of, you can almost imagine people in the head office of that garage saying, oh, we'll just, you know, we'll, we'll install this new branch management system, it'll be fine. But without understanding the stakes and the needs of the people who are actually involved, you head into this whole calamitous, uh, calamitous uh, situation. And it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because when we say the term stakeholder, well, I don't know about you, but I think of definitely project stakeholders. So we've got our sponsor and our subject matter experts and all those sorts of good things. And we may well have external stakeholders as well. And if we're on a project that is involving customers, we may well put a few personas together. Um, and a persona's great technique. Raise your hand if you've ever used a personas as a technique. It's, uh, yeah, fantastic. If you haven't, look it up. Awesome technique. But and I sort of feel a bit like I'm breaking secret, sort of BA secret code here, but the thing about personas is they're really supposed to be the face of the data, the face of the insight. And I bet we've all seen situations where the personas are based on no data. They're just based on what someone in marketing reckons. And the danger with that is that what we then end up doing is building services for what someone in marketing reckons. And that might not be representative of what anyone actually wants. Like probably, if you work in, in, in car mechanics, you probably think everyone knows about cars, because we tend to think that other people are like us. So we build entire services and systems that don't serve people in the way that they, they necessarily want to be. So they appear tricky, they appear a conflict emerges. And then what we end up doing, not by deliberately, but we, we can end up doing it, is we end up saying to a whole bunch of legitimate stakeholders, well, I'm sorry, you're an edge case. <laughs> you're an exception. You go into the exception queue. And as a customer, that doesn't feel too great. And as a stakeholder, that doesn't feel too great. So it's kind of interesting, isn't it? You've got all of these personas, um, but they don't necessarily reflect reality. So here's a persona for you. 
This is Bernard. Um, it's not really. It's a piece of stock image. But imagine for a moment it was Bernard. Bernard is in his early 70s. When he was age 65, he received a diagnosis of early onset dementia. He still lives at home at the moment, but his memory is faded, is fading. This means that he can't remember passwords or PINs. It also means he can't remember some of the financial transactions that he made. So when he does manage to get into his account, he thinks that people are stealing from him. He's also built, built up a bit of a story about conspiracy theories because he's ringing banks who are saying that, no, it was definitely you that did this transaction, so he thinks that the banks are against him. Sometimes his family members need to carry out transactions for him under power of attorney. I don't think I've ever worked on a project where we have built something that would work for Bernard. Yet this is a real person that has a real need on a whole bunch of the kind of services that we work on. And it's no, you know, if you look at the number of people with dementia, it's by no means an edge case. And that's just one, one example. So we've got to think about the ethics of what we're doing as well. We need to build for the likes of, of Bernard. So I want to talk through some techniques. Um, I've got broadly three topics, three parts. I'm going to talk about stakeholders and stakes. So a few techniques for doing stakeholder analysis. I'm then going to talk about different perspectives on situations. Um, just to pre-warn you, there will be a little bit of audience interaction in that <coughs> bit. Um, so prepare yourself for a little bit of audience interaction in that bit. And very briefly at the end, I want to talk about zooming out. I want to talk about what we mean by engagement and how we engage. So we'll start with stakeholders and stakes. And I'm pretty sure when I say stakeholder analysis, many of us will be familiar with, will think of a grid that probably looks something like this. Okay. I'm, se I'm seeing nods. There are different versions of it. This happens to be the version that's from the Business Analysis Body of Knowledge Guide. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's a really useful uh, body of knowledge. If you're an IIBA member, you get it for free. And if you haven't seen it before, it's relatively straightforward. You take uh, a stakeholder, you assign them a score of how influential they are from naught to 10, and you think about how much impact the situation is having on them, positive or negative, or how much impact a solution would have on them, and you give them a score, and, and it gives us an approximation of the type of engagement techniques that we might use. So raise your hand if you have ever seen this or anything like it. So, if you've, so I, think that, I think that's almost all of us. Keep your hand raised if you've ever used it. Okay. So again, most of us, if you haven't, excellent technique. Highly recommend it. However, if you have used it, you may well have found a few situations where there are people that don't fit neatly into the categories like they should. You know, we might have a situation where, for example, we say, ah, well, you know, Natasha, Natasha's here. Natasha's very, very influence, influential. She's going to be impacted. Well, except for the non-functionals, where she's got far less influence than the, you know, the, the design board or sign-off team or whatever. And for another part of the project, she's here and here and, uh, and here. So she's sort of dotted about the, 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 the grid. And that's still useful. It's useful insight for us to know, but it can get very busy very quickly because you start to add other stakeholders and they're in different positions and other stakeholders. And then all of a sudden, I always think it looks a bit like a fly swatter, <laughs> like we sort of swat our stakeholders. And it's difficult to read. The other thing I think that we, as a community of BAs, should perhaps um, challenge on a model like this is this quadrant down here which is highly impacted but low influence. And the traditional version of this says keep informed. So highly impacted but low influence, just keep informed? Think about the garage example. That's your mechanics in the actual branches. They're the people who know how the work works. Like we probably want to take a bit more of a, an active engagement there. It's probably people like customers as well. So we need to perhaps rethink that quadrant. I mean, it was only ever an approximation anyway. So a couple of techniques, and I, I mean, again, I wouldn't diss this technique. It's a useful one. 
But there are some other techniques we can use as well as or instead of this. One that takes this approach and turns it on its head is the stakeholder rainbow. And I'll, I'll, I'll put an example up, and I pretty much won't have to explain it. It's, it's really intuitive. This is an example of a stakeholder rainbow. You can see you've got exactly the same dimensions. You've got influence from most influence to least influence, but it's like a, a sort of you know, radar-type screen. And you've got whether people are least, moderately, or most affected. Now, although drawing it like this might seem like a subtle difference, it has quite a powerful psychological effect, I've, I've found. Because what it does is it clusters all of those people who are most affected right at the centre. <laughs> Almost like, if you think about it, it doesn't matter. If someone's really affected by a change or a problem or a situation or whatever, even if they've got no influence, well, we've really got to consider them. We've got to create a world that works for them as well. Otherwise, they're going to emerge later, probably as a group, to protest whatever it is we're doing. So to avoid that kind of trickiness, we can consider them from the, the very, very go, and not just consider, but engage. Because so often, and I'm sure you'll have seen projects where this happens, there are people down here who are very unhappy because their work's been made much more difficult by a, a decision that's been made in a cosy meeting room somewhere over here. And if you're in the head office of a national firm of garages, in your comfortable office, it's probably very easy to say, yeah, the mechanics, they'll adapt really easily to a new computer system. But, you know, go down there, see the grease, see the swafiga, see the, the actual situation. You might think, uh, we might think differently. It's also useful because different stakeholders in different places have different stakes. Do you think people down here, they're probably using or affected directly by the thing. They're going to care about usability and the nuts and bolts and the detail. This person over here is probably worried about the money, how much it's going to cost and how much it's going to make. So it's a really useful, different way of thinking about stakeholder analysis. It also deliberately doesn't give us any suggestions of stakeholder engagement approaches because it takes the view that every project is different and we should, you know, as practitioners, read the context. So a useful alternative view, you can do it on a flip chart, it's a you know, relatively intuitive thing. But this still doesn't solve the problem of the fly swatter, <laughs> of knowing when to engage people. So another technique we can use as well as this is the... Uh, oh, uh, yeah, just one more thing before I carry on. What I tend to do personally, and this is a personal reflection, I tend to draw a big red boundary around that to really draw people's attention to, look, we've got to have these people on side. Doesn't matter how much influence they've got, if they're not on side, the thing will fail. You won't get your money if, if these people's needs aren't met. So we better understand their stakes. So to solve the problem of the fly swatter, we can use a technique that's known as the Stakeholder Interest Intensity Index. And with this, we take a stakeholder and we consider an area of the project. And we give them a score for that area. And we do it on two dimensions, by the level of vested interest and influence. And you do one to five on each. So if someone is very high interest, very low influence, there'll be a five slash one. Um, if they're low interest, high influence, there'll be one slash five, and, and so on. That probably sounds a bit abstract, so here's a, a, like a worked example, if you like. You've got an area here, so again, it's all made up, but you'll get the picture. Scanning and workflow, online portal, online invoices. Uh, we've got different stakeholders or stakeholder groups, so customers, call centre and so on. And we've got our vested interest and influence score. So here you can see the call centre are high interest, kind of low uh, influence on the scanning and workflow. When it comes to invoices, finance are very high influence and, and, and reasonably interested as well. And, and I, I, I know what you're thinking. I can tell by your faces what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, that's kind of interesting, but it doesn't tell us a lot more than the fly swatter. <coughs> and I'd agree with you. But the technique comes with a formula. 
the formula looks quite complicated if you're not mathematically minded. It looks a bit funky, but you can just put it straight into Excel and it will do it for you. Um, the formula is the square root of v times i over 25. <laughs> or rolls off the tongue. And um, this normalizes those figures to a single index between 0 and 1. Now, one important thing to note about that is if someone is, say, high influence, uh, sorry, high interest, low influence, they'll still get a moderate score out the back, so they don't get disregarded, they stay on our radar. So with that formula, the, the grid would look something like this. Again, it, it's kind of interesting, it's like, yeah, you're getting closer, Adrian, but still not, I couldn't show this to an exec. But the great thing, of course, about having a number in Excel is you could, you could go on with a bit of jiggery-pokery and a bit of conditional formatting uh, to create a heat map. And let's face it, everyone loves a heat map. Someone literally just had a sharp intake of breath there. I mean, it's exciting, but not that exciting, folks. Um, and, and again, it's only an approximation. It's, it's not scientific. But you know what it's like with engagement and communication? Almost too much communication is as bad as not enough. If we bombard every, everyone with everything, they switch off. We may as well not communicate. This helps us focus it. So, for example, well, you know what? Scanning and workflow, yeah, the call centre. doesn't matter that they're not influential. We need, to, we need to go and have a conversation with them. When it comes to online invoices, well, actually, uh, the finance team are really, really crucial. So it gives us a, a way of targeting, targeting the type of stakeholder engagement that we're going to do which will help us avoid those tricky conflict situations because we're engaging people at the right time. Of course, we should revisit all of this as we go through the project. So we've talked about stakeholders and stakes with our impact interest grid, our fly swatter, with our rainbow, and also with our vested interest index. So I want to talk now about perspectives on situations. And remember, this is the bit where I primed you to say there will be a little bit of audience interaction. But since I know that at this point in the evening, audience interaction is often hard, I do have a couple of prizes to give away. So yes, so you might win if you take part in this, either a free book um, or a free electronic version of that book. <laughs> so I am going to ask a question. It's going to sound like a trick question and it isn't. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the question out. I then want you to shout out your answer to it. So I'll read the question, I'll explain it, then I'll literally throw it over to you and I want you to shout out your gut instinct. And by the way, just shout out the first thing that comes to your mind. Don't self-censor. Well, maybe self-censor a little bit, knowing the crowd. <laughs> um, um, and uh, whoever I hear the first or the loudest or whatever will win a prize, OK? And if you win the first prize, you'll get a choice of the book or the e-book. The second person is stuck with... Uh, uh, with, with, with whatever the first person didn't want. I shouldn't say stuck, um, of course. So, my question for you is, what is the Parking Enforcement Service for? Now, if you're not familiar with the Parking Enforcement Service, they are the lovely ladies and gents that put these little sticky things on yours and particularly my windshields when we don't park where we're supposed to. So, I will throw it out to you now. What is the Parking Enforcement Service for? Money. money. Who said money? Okay, thank you. A round of applause to this gentleman here. And uh, would, would you like the physical book or the... The, oh, the, physical, book. the physical book. Okay, fantastic. So money, what else, what else is it for? Safety. Public safety. Who said public safety? Fantastic. A uh, round of applause. Thank you very much. And you have the, the, the voucher. There's a, a download code in there. So you're most welcome. Um, okay, so we've got um, public safety and we've got money. Uh, so who's right then? Yeah, both, probably. It probably is both. So imagine doing a project within the Park Enforcement Department where there are stakeholders who hold those views. If, you, if we didn't know that, if we didn't acknowledge it, well, of course they're going to seem tricky because they disagree about something quite fundamental about the service. Pretty important we know that, that we understand that. So there's a technique that comes from uh, Peter Checkland originally, the soft systems methodology, SSM, if you're familiar with it. If you're not, it doesn't matter. I'm using it somewhat out of context here. Um, it's known as a root definition. 
This version I'm showing you is PQR. The official elaboration of PQR is do P by Q in order to contribute towards achieving R. Um, if that works for you, great. I embellish it a little bit, or I use an embellishment, and I use this. A system to do something by some means in order to achieve, in order to contribute towards achieving some goals. So a system to do something by some means in order to contribute towards achieving some goals. And if you boil that down, really is, it's the what, how, and why from that stakeholder's perspective. And that's a really powerful thing to know, because if we're going to empathise and if we're going to deliver for them, then we, we probably ought to think about these things. And it's really freaky, right, because the two examples that you folks gave about money and public safety are exactly what I've got in my next slide. <laughs> so it's almost like you'd seen the deck before. Um, and, and they're not stooges, by the way. Oh, we haven't met until today. So, um, so we might have, for example, one view, which is, well, you know what? The parking enforcement service exists to generate revenue from motorists who break the law by diligently issuing tickets. This is in order to contribute towards an overall goal of balancing the city's books, the sort of cynical capitalist view of parking tickets. But then over here, we might have a different view, which is the parking enforcement service is a system to keep road users and pedestrians safe by issuing fines and providing useful information to those who park illegally in order to contribute towards achieving safe, uncongested roads. The kind of optimist, the fluffy bunny approach to parking enforcement. And if we didn't know that different stakeholders had these, these different views, well, we'd, we'd, we'd come across that conflict. So think back, thinking back to that vested intent, in interest intensity index, if you've got that grid and you add the perspective for each group, you're starting to get a really, really rich view of what the person thinks, or at the very least our interpretation of what they think, and when we need to engage them. So we're starting to build up a really, you know, a really useful knowledge that we can uh, build upon. We could go even further, and for large transformational change, this is very worth doing. And a question we often ask as BAs is, what would success look like for you? And one way we can measure that it, from, from the perspective of a stakeholder is to use, and again, this is originally from, from Checkland. Um, Checkland talks about either three or five E's. I'm using the three E's here, um, which are efficacy. And efficacy is how do we know the thing is doing the thing it's supposed to be doing? Right? In the short term, how do we know it's working? Efficiency is how do we know it's doing that with the least amount of resources? And effectiveness is how do we know it's actually achieving the longer term strategic element of that root definition, the, the why element. And what's really interesting I've found, and I mean this is a purely subjective uh, practitioner opinion, but I've found that quite often stakeholders will agree on the surface. They'll agree about these two. But when you discuss this one, you start to discover that there are fundamental differences. Because think about that parking situation. We've got the, you know, we've got the sort of the, the cynical capitalist view. And they might say, well, you know what, I judge efficacy by how many tickets are given. And, and actually, the, the fluffy bunny safety might say, yeah, actually, because we want to be in the short term issuing tickets. Great, we agree. Uh, efficiency, we might say, well, I want to do that as cheaply as possible. Mm, yeah, from a, so do I. But then you talk about effectiveness. And the, and the, the cynical capitalist view would be, well, we want to make more money. I don't care if people are parking everywhere. The more money, the better. At which point the opposing or the, the, the different view would say, well, hang on, I agree with the first two, but no, ideally we'd have zero tickets issued eventually and we'd have safer roads. There'd be fewer ca casualties, less congestion. That's what we'd measure there. So I don't know if you've ever had those meetings. I suspect you have had these meetings. <laughs> Where you go in and everyone agrees... And you walk away, and it's like they have collective amnesia. It's like they don't, they, it's like they don't, they, they, they've agreed, but it's like they, that agreement never happened. That can sometimes be because there are the, these deeper underlying stakes, views, perspectives that aren't addressed. So using things like PQR, cultivating the conversation, 
if we can just tease it out, cultivate the conversation, then we can learn our way through it together uh, with the stakeholders. You know, no one individually knows enough, but together we might just about know enough to, to solve some of the problems we, we face in our, 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 our jobs these days. And if you think about the three E's, well, we build up a really quite uh, rich picture of the different stakeholders here because we've got our vested interest index, we've got our perspectives, we've got our three E's. We're really starting to know what makes them tick. We're really starting to understand them, when to engage them and so on. But a few of you now, and I know, because I would be thinking the same, are thinking, that's fine, Adrian. The bit I've got an issue with is you've got one big, cloudy group called customers. And that's a bit of a huge generalisation. Like, are all customers the same? Almost certainly not. And that's one of the great things about using an approach such as this, is you can say, well, do all of our customers think like this? Do they all value these things? No? OK, fine. Let's split it. Let's slice it. Let's divide it. Let's create another one. But we've spotted it, and we've spotted it early, so we can build for the variety that we want to build for. Now, one of the challenges will be, of course, however good we are at doing this, however much we try and preempt that conflict, those tricky situations, those tricky stakeholders, they will still see things differently. I think it's probably something to do with human nature. We all bring our own lens to the world. And I know as BAs we like to think we're objective, but we aren't. You know, we still bring a view to the situation as well. And it's almost like, if you think about the types of projects and problems we work on being like a ball of tangled yarn. Well, you know what? This expert is an expert in the red yarn, so they tend to see the red yarn. The person over there, they're, they're an expert in the pink yarn, so they tend to see the pink yarn. They, they'll, they'll argue, and, but they'll both be right. But if we can somehow get that yarn out of their head, their mental model out of their head, so that we can understand their stake, their viewpoint, and actually surface it in some sort of model, <coughs> so we, we can discuss the model, model rather than the person, then we might get closer to solving some of the complex situations that we work in in our organisations. So there's an excellent technique called cognitive mapping. Now, I don't have time to do this technique justice, so I'll give you a very quick overview, but if you want to know more, um, as I say, there's references at the end, or I could yarn on about this for hours during the break as well. But one of the most important things, one of the unique things about cognitive mapping is it uses a construct, a, an, an idea known as bipolar constructs. And the idea of bipolar constructs is if, they say, if someone says something's a problem, so say someone says, well, we're trying to solve, you know, we're trying to, uh, we, we have this problem that profits are reducing. Um, the question you ask is, well, well what do you want to ha happen instead? You know, what is it you want to have happen? Is it the opposite, you know, for you, is the opposite of reducing profits, is it increased profits? Because, like, they might say, no, actually, we just want it to stay steady. <laughs> you know, that's a different interpretation of the problem. And I know it sounds of often it's obvious, but if you start to un unravel these things, you find that different stakeholders, they, they agree on the problem, but the opposite, the thing they're trying to achieve, is subtly different. So I'll show you an abstract example first, just to show you the notation. And the notation is just words and arrows. So we would put the, like the, the problem in inverted commas at the very head. And the way that this is read is the three dots are read as, it, you know, instead of type of thing. So it might be a reduction in profits instead of the profits staying level. And then we trace back the multiple causes. So, and that's where, in our, you know, we use all of our good BA techniques like five whys and interviews and workshops. Although I, I think with five whys, it's probably five whys and why else? Because we don't just want to get one chain of causation, we want to get all of them. So here's a, a, a worked example. You can see we've got a decrease in customer retention instead of maintaining a stable level. That's at the top of our tree, that's what we're focusing on. And a key thing here is we'd interview the stakeholders separately first. Or if it's a group like customers, we'd get some kind of focus group to get a representative view. And 
Why is this happening? Well, because there's a decrease in customer satisfaction instead of maintaining a stable level. Okay. Why is that? Well, because orders are regularly, regularly delivered late rather than on time. Okay. Why does that happen? Well, because we're using cut price delivery firms instead of full service firms. Okay. Why else might that happen? Well, also we've got this issue with incorrect data rather than correct and complete. And why is that? Well, because there's no validation on the IT system versus having sensible validation. I mean, this is just a fragment, just to give you the idea. But those sorts of conversations, again, it opens the dialogue. Now, if you get these from different stakeholders separately, I, again, I, I think in pictures, I imagine it as like getting that wool out of their head. So you get the pink wool out of the, the pink stakeholder's head, the, the red wool. Then you can bring them together because you've got a whole bunch of cognitive maps. You can start to workshop it. You know, literally bring it together and say, well, you know what, folks, good news story, you agree on 70% of the problem. Thumbs up. However, let's discuss the 30% you don't. And we do so, remember, with our understanding of their perspectives and stakes, and you get towards what's sometimes called a group or strategic map, but really a shared understanding. The really, I think, great thing about this approach is once you've got that understanding, you've got a huge map and you're like, wow, here are all the sub-causes. OK, which one do we start with? <laughs> you know, oh, you know, we've got an issue because we're using cut price delivery firms. Well, I'll tell you what, let's do an experiment. Let's use DHL for a month and see what it does to the figures. If it works, amplify it. If it doesn't work, attenuate it, you know, stop it, and then try again. It's, it really works with the idea of like, business agility, of, of carrying out experiments, of, of seeing what works, and refining this model, because this is only a model, remember, it's not reality. We need to test it and continually uh, adapt it. OK, so we've talked about stakeholders and stakes with our, our traditional four-box grid, the fly swatter, with our rainbow and with our vested interest index. We've talked about perspectives on situations with our PQR, our how, what, why, uh, and also, we've, we've talked about using cognitive maps and group maps or strategic maps. So I want to talk very briefly now about zooming out, very, very briefly. And what I'm talking about here really is how we, how we engage or what we mean by the word engage. So I'm going to ask for just a, another little bit of audience interaction, and I'm afraid I don't have a prize for this bit. But please, please shout out anyway. <laughs> and... Um, it, this time it really is a trick question, <laughs> but my trick question for you is, what is that? Don't be shy. It's a council notice, yep. What else? It is planning permission, yep. That, ladies and gentlemen, is consultation. <laughs> um, or rather, it is a statutory expression of consultation. It isn't really consultation as you and I would think of it. Because I don't know if you've ever tried to read one of those. Um, but I've got, my eyesight's OK. It's not great. I, I find it really hard to read. The contrast also isn't great with the colours and so on and so forth. But this led me to think, well, what do we actually mean by engagement, consultation, all these other sorts of terms that we use probably every day in our BA career? And it's almost like there's a spectrum. So at this end... There, there might be like the, the passive approach. And I remember once many, many moons ago in a, in a former life, I was a, a, a junior manager managing a, a team. And the senior manager, when unpopular change was coming in, would say, it is your job, Adrian, to tell and sell your staff. And I'm seeing some smiles. We probably... A few of us have been in that situation. It's like, so essentially what my manager was saying is, I don't care what you think, I don't care what they think, your job is to get them on board. Uh, and there will be times, by the way, where that's okay. Like if the fire alarm went off in a moment and a fire steward said, don't go out that door, it's dangerous, use that door, that isn't the time to sit around and have a co-creation workshop. You know, in that situation, just get out the fire door. But... Not all situations are like that. Then there's consultation. And consultation, to me at least, implies we're asking for opinions, but someone else is making the decision. And if that's the case, I think as long as we're honest about it, it's probably okay. 
The trouble comes when we pretend we're engaging, or an organisation or a project pretends it's engaging, but it's really just going to take opinions and then disregard them. That's a, probably a bit of an ethical dilemma. Then there's engagement, which would imply more of a two-way dialogue. So perhaps involving people in the project, <coughs> have them prioritise requirements. They own that prioritisation. And we have interactive participation, where actually, you know what, they, they come on the project team. That really is a co-creation workshop. And then at the other end of the spectrum, and I, I have to say I've never seen this myself in an organisation, although I'm told there are organisations where this exists, which is self-mobilisation you know, and true self-organising teams. And, and I was thinking about this when I was, I was putting this presentation together. Although I gather organisations like Netflix and Spotify have elements of this, you know, one organisation that I think has achieved this impeccably, that's mobilised a bunch of people from all sorts of different backgrounds over a shared set of principles, and put, put, put to one side whether you agree with their message or their mechanisms for a moment, but is Extinction Rebellion. Because they've managed to get a whole bunch of people to do stuff in a really coordinated way, um, without necessarily centralised control. So that's at the other end of the spectrum. Whether or not that's relevant for your, my organisation, don't know. But now think about this as like a slider a, a, and, and a conversation we could have at the beginning of our projects is what type of, you know, what type of participation do we want? You know, is it just, well actually we're just going to tell people, well fine, you know, if, if that's the situation, a, a, as long as that's the best approach, then let's go with it. But probably we're more likely to be engaging or participating in, in some way. But again, it creates the conversation. We consciously choose a particular point on the dial rather than just drifting towards whatever the organisational culture's default is. Another segue on this actually is this also has a lot to do with power. <laughs> because if you are going to take a passive approach, you pretty much better make sure you have actually got hierarchical power over those folks. Otherwise, it ain't going to work. Whereas here, the further we get down this approach, the more we're actually saying, you know what, we're facilitating the change, but you folks are going to be living with it, so let's work with you. You know, let's actually have power together. And, and at the very end, of course, we'd be delegating power to uh, entirely, which, again, m may have applications. I, I, it's not, not something I've seen, but I'm sure it exists out there. So just a few other ideas before I, I, I start to close. Um, I wanted to briefly mention Pareto. And I'm pretty sure, like, raise your hand if you've heard of Pareto or the 80-20 rule. Okay, good. Useful. It's a useful heuristic, a useful shortcut. Does anyone happen to know where the 80-20 percentage came from? Right, so Pareto, it turns out, was a very intelligent, talented sociologist, economist, engineer as well, I think, in Italy. And he lived towards the end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s. An observation he made was at that point in Italy, 80% of the land was owned by 20% of the people. Now just pause for a moment and think that some decisions on your, my, all of our projects are made on a ratio that relates to property ownership in Italy at the end of the 1800s. <laughs> I'm not saying it's wrong. But perhaps we ought to sometimes challenge that and say, well, hang on a minute, maybe 40% of our business comes from 80% of our... You know, the, they don't have to add up to 100, right? It's, so sometimes getting the data might change our view. 80-20 is useful, but we ought to remember it, it probably wasn't intended to be used quite the way it's, uh, it's used in common currency these days. The other thing is about zooming out. Right, really zooming out, because people give us a particular problem, the, 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 the tendency is, is to focus on that problem, but we've got to understand the, the, you know, the, the, the subsystems, the ecosystems around it. We need to make sure that we're thinking about our stakeholders and their stakes, thinking about their perspectives, and also thinking about the voices that might be getting marginalised, the people that everyone's forgotten, you know, the sort of building it for Bernard, Bernard might not be able to get to the table, but Bernard and others like him uh, need, to be, need to be represented. 
And finally, journeys. Now, customer journeys, if you haven't come across the technique, excellent. Excellent approach, would really recommend it. The slight challenge I've found with it as a practitioner is the word customer. <laughs> because actually, don't internal folks in an organization deserve a pretty good journey as well? <laughs> and we can use techniques like this just as effectively for internal journeys as well as uh, people outside the scope of the organization. Uh, it's also, if you think back to Bernard, you start to get really interesting cases where there are people who are customers who aren't users and people who are users who aren't customers or beneficiaries. So for example, when Bernard's son rings up the bank using a power of attorney to get some information, well, they're not a beneficiary, they're not a customer, but they still need to be a service user. So we've got to think about those sorts of elements as well. So I've, and this is a pure personal viewpoint, I've started just calling them journeys or service journeys. It doesn't really matter if it's a customer. Right? You know, we, can use, we can use them. They have broad application beyond what, um, what, what the name customer journey might imply. So we've talked about stakeholders and stakes with our fly swatter, our rainbow, our vested interest intensity index. We talked about perspectives on the situation with PQR, cognitive mapping, group mapping. And we talked about zooming out with the peril of Pareto, zooming out to get those marginalized voices uh, and thinking about different journeys. So I wanted to finish really where I began to give you an update. <laughs> on the story I told at the very beginning, because I, I started with this curveball story about the car. And you might be wondering, well, what car did you buy? <laughs> and I wouldn't want to leave any closed loops. So this was my, my car that sadly I had to scrap my 2007 Ford Fiesta. Um, it, this got me really thinking. I, I mean, I was, there, there were a lot of things happening at the time which were making me reevaluate a whole bunch of things. And, I, and this is going to sound really geeky, but I was thinking about what car to buy, and I'm like, hang on a minute, I'm a business analyst. Why am I jumping to a solution here? Shouldn't I apply my own techniques to, to this decision? And remember, I'm a reluctant car user, and I don't drive very often. I looked between MOTs, I'd driven 2,000 miles. I drive once every two weeks. I don't actually need a car. I need to use a car when I need it. I don't need to own one. So I didn't replace it. And this is my car now, or one of the cars I have, or rather one of the cars Enterprise Car Club has. So I pay a mod modest monthly fee. When I want a car, I go up to the car with an app, the door opens, I type in a pin, I get the, the key fob, and I'm charged by the hour. And I've done the calculations, because let's face it, I wouldn't be a BA if I didn't do a mini CBA. <laughs> and I reckon it's going to cut my motoring costs down by about 50%. And I get to drive around in a 2019 car that somebody else services. So I don't even have to have the, you know, the time dealing with the, the, the mechanics and so on. And this is another thing. If we understand each other's stakes, we can come up with solutions that we might not have otherwise thought about. Like, that's one example. Think back to the, the original garage. Well, if I'd understood their stake, if they'd understood mine, if I'd been a bit braver and said, I don't know what you're talking about with the timing belt, well, maybe we'd have reached a different solution, which is they give me 500 quid and we just call it quits. So understanding stakes, needs, perspectives, whatever we call them, can help us co-create better outcomes where everyone wins. So my final ponder point that I'd like you to, to leave you with, because we talked about marginalised voices. I think it, it, it's useful for us all to think about, well, you know what, who's the stakeholder that we've forgotten? Which stakeholder on your project, my project, all of our projects is currently not being heard? And how can we as an enthusiastic, empowered community of practitioners ensure that their voice is heard? Because when we design with diversity and inclusion by default, everyone wins, we get better outcomes. And if we do that, we'll be able to deliver projects that deliver better outcomes for our organisations, our sponsors, our stakeholders, and even more importantly, do that in a sustainable way for the communities in which we serve. And with that, I will say thank you very much.